Out of all the fields, you could have gone into any number of them, but you chose this one. Why epigenetics? Let me give you two answers. The, the real answer and the made-up answer. Okay, I like both. <laughs> Already, and I haven't even heard them. The real answer is serendipity. What happened was that I was studying dental medicine, and to get my degree, I had to do a thesis. So I walked down the, ro this, the corridor, and who did I see? Aaron Razin who is one of the founders of the fields of epigenetics, who came back from a postdoc at Caltech and was studying DNA methylation in a virus that infects E. coli. The virus is not important really, but this is how we started. And this is how sci scientific ideas start. They don't start because you walk, woke up in the morning and said, ah, oh, I have this grand idea. It's just simple curiosity. What does this methyl group do on this virus? And the rest is history. But to be honest, I also like the field very much. And the reason is that it allowed me to integrate humanities and the hard sciences. A humanities way of thinking about interactions between people, not just molecules, about society in general, about evolution and how animals interact with each other. And at the same time use, you know, very exquisite chemical methodology. And that's unique about this. And building bridges between those disciplines, I always thought was the major problem in science today and mm. in humanities. People, sometimes I meet sociologists and they don't even want even to hear about biology. It's like a, a mean word. It's like the words that the others are using mm. and, and vice versa, right? And so the integration is key. It's key. And it has to start in kindergarten. Right? We immediately stream our kids to those who can do maths and those who can do humanities. And usually we respect those who can do math more than those who can do humanities. But that's wrong. And I think the science of epigenetics is showing how you can use concepts from the social humanities world in hard science and vice versa. And so it became like a mission. Uh, of believing in an integrated, you know, world of knowledge. And the fact that humans are, you know, one integrated entity is not bodies without minds or minds without bodies, mm. that the two have to talk to each other. And I love interacting across disciplines. Uh, we don't think about, you know, we, we think about stress in our lives, mm -hmm. but we don't think about stress in animals. Right. And yet you were just at a conference and you got this really interesting question, right. which most of us would never think about. Tell us that story. So I was talking about epigenetics to a group of Canadian um, this, uh, people working either in the science or in the practice of uh, raising animals for food and for milk. And one of the guys in the crowd, I don't remember his name, asked, oh, what you told us has huge meaning for us because we separate the calves from the mothers 24 hours after birth. How does it affect the quality of milk? He understood that the way you treat animals affects what happened to your children who drink the milk from the animals. Yeah. And he asked how the stress of being separated from the mother or the, affects the, the quality of the milk and probably affects the quality of the meat as well. Which affects us. Which in, the, in turn affects us because it changes the chemicals that are in the food and we then eat them and they affect the way we react. But yet most of us would never think about that. Right. That's where integration comes. That's when you understand that there are really no boundaries to humans. They are one integrated entity. And integration is within our own body, but also between bodies, that we are not on our own. <laughs> Epigenetics carries what could be an appealing message to many. DNA alone is not destiny. Let me ask you about uh, programming, because yes. you've used that metaphor. Uh, so mom's stress, she programs, this is going to be a really kind of tough world right. that you're going to uh, live in. But we can reprogram yes. our DNA. Talk to us about that, because, I mean, if people watching this, they're, they're right. fascinated with this. What do I do? I mean, geez, right. my, my parents gave me all this. Uh, that's why I've been in therapy for 20 years or right. whatever. 
but I can reprogram. Right. And the difference between epigenetics and genetics is the reversibility. A coder can rewrite the code, can take a line from the script. This is what we're trying to figure out, how to do that. We're not going to change the operating system, because once you change that, you, you don't have the computer anymore. We want to change the program. There are two ways to do it. The two ways we know how to do it. One is the better way, I think, which is through lifestyle interventions. Um, you know, we know that exercise has profound impacts on the way the DNA is programmed. We know eating habits has an, uh, an impact. We know probably taking a vacation from time to time has an impact. We know having a public um, park with, with exercise tools next to you can have an impact. So, and this is where we want to use technology and more deeper machine learning analysis to figure out what are the good, the combinations that are actually useful for you, not just in general. The second thing, of course, is epigenetic treatments. And again, that could be divided to two. One is classic drugs, drugs that work on the coders. They can slow down a coder or make a coder work faster. And we use them in cancer therapy already to change the epigenetic programming. We try to use them in, for example, in addiction, to change the program of addiction, uh, or in chronic pain. And so this is a traditional way of handling it. Because epigenetics is reversible, drugs can act on it and change it both ways. But the better way is probably using natural products that can do the same and can actually reprogram uh, your DNA. So I won't promise you that we know all the answers to this. We need to learn more, and we will learn more by partnering with the people who are actually doing all these experiments on themselves and telling us what they're doing to figure out what is the best way to, um, to reprogram the DNA to fit with the life that you want to live in and to uh, you know, stop your binging or stop your addiction uh, or stop your pain or um, protect you from cancer. Epigenetics will change the way we think about medicine as a partnership uh, between people and you know, scientists and, and doctors rather than as a one way. You know, uh, I go to my doctor and he tells me what to do. You see an entirely different world moving yes. forward. Yes. Because of this. Yes. And I think uh, two revolutions happened. First, we can read the code. I mean, that was the greatest revolution in biology. We know the code. We can read it. We don't understand it completely. The second thing is social media and technology have developed the tools to talk to millions of people and to get data back for millions of people, something we could never have done in medicine before. And mathematics has given us machine learning that allows us to analyze millions and millions of data points and very complex interactions between data points. For Moshe, understanding epigenetically what leads to disease is the key to understanding how to reverse those changes. It's interesting, I was online and looking at some of the, the papers right. that you've worked on uh, dealing with obesity, anorexia. Right. So talk to me about it more generally how this field can help us with perhaps early detection of diseases. Right. So once we understand how this works, we can understand that this can help us being resilient, but also cause disease. And disease is probably caused when there's a misfit between this program and what actually happens. So let's, let's, let's look at this example. For example, the mother did not receive enough food. She sent a signal to our offspring, this is a world where there's no food. That leads to programming of the brain to want to binge whenever you see a meal. That will save your life. However, in modern societies, the connection between lack and food and poverty is not as simple. 
in wealthy Western societies, poor people actually have access to more calories than rich people. Rich people don't need the calories to make them happy. They have other things making them happy. For poor people, they can access a McDonald's for one dollar. And it has a huge amount of calories, which never happened in history before. Mm -hmm. So now those genes that were there to protect them, the binging that was there to keep them alive when famine happens, there's no famine in America. Those genes are now leading to obesity. You can think about stress the same way, right? If, if, if the adversity early in life tells your m mother that, you know, this is going to be a rough world, you be, be better hyper anxious, don't interact with anybody because he might shoot you, and, and so on. And then you grow up in a middle class Western democracy where nobody is there to shoot you, but you behave as if somebody is going to shoot you. You become a social misfit. So the same traits that evolutionary were protecting you from trouble, because we have changed the world so fast that even evolution can't pick up with it, causing disease. So you can think about probably most of the common diseases caused by some epigenetic mishaps or um, misfits between programming and, and what happens later. Epigenetics is not only key in understanding how to treat diseases, it also could help predict diseases. Almost all human disease has a programming problem. As our phone, when an app gets, you know, some code that is, is, uh, is miscoded, then the app doesn't work anymore. And how do you fix the app? First, you need to know where the problem in coding is. So you need a good coder to read the code and see where there's a mistake. And then you need to correct it. So I believe epigenetics will do both. First, we can read the code. We can map epigenetics and see if there is a change. That change can tell us early that there's going to be a disease that is developed. So the one area that epigenetics will contribute enormously will be to early prediction. The second area is epigenetics is not like genetics that tells you you have a bad gene. Go blame your ancestors. Epigenetics says that these changes are caused by environmental changes. Some we know, some we don't. But they also can go back by environmental changes. So we know, for example, that enrichment of rats' life can change their epigenetics. So I think epigenetics will create a paradigm for detection and prevention. But also, if things went wrong, for intervention. Because we can use different drugs to change the way the DNA is programmed. And the most advanced, of course, of all these uh, diseases is cancer. In cancer, we are starting to use uh, mapping of those programs, the DNA methylation marks, to detect cancer early. Moshe is founder of HKG Epitherapeutics, based in China. The company is developing tools for early detection of cancer. Talk to me about the evolution of the work that you're doing, because now I know you've, you've got a lab in, in China. Right. Uh, where do you see your uh, work going moving forward? So the labs that I have, so we started a company, a startup in Hong Kong, uh, to develop blood-based early detection markers of cancer using DNA methylation technology. And... Um, and also we have a lab in Guangzhou that takes care of the Chinese market. The lab in Hong Kong takes care of the rest of the world for legal reasons. Um, why China and why Asia? I think the, uh, the next big, thing, big things will happen in Asia uh, because of two main reasons. First, there's a lot of cash in Asia that can fund science. And we are kind of draining cash in, in the Western world. The second thing is the number of people the impact that you can have. For example, if we are trying to develop early detection markers for liver cancer, in China alone, half a million people die every year from liver cancer. Liver cancer is usually, almost always, detected late because you don't know if you have liver cancer until you're really sick. But the other interesting thing about China and Asia is that liver cancer happens in certain people, people who are infected with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, mostly hepatitis B, who have chronic liver disease. 
So we have also the population that we know is at high risk. So no, we know where to go. And there are uh, close to 100 million people with chronic hepatitis B in China. They're taking bombs. They know that at some point they will get liver cancer. Just don't know when. And in spite of imaging and other things we have today, they're always detected late. So if we can have a program that can follow up these people every year or every six months with a simple blood test, we can probably save millions and millions of lives. And the cost will be, you know, less than $100 per person. So as far as impact, this will have a huge impact compared to, you know, epigenetic editing, which will form, which will create some blue-eyed babies for some rich people mm -hmm. uh, or treat some rare genetic diseases. We're talking things that can actually change, uh, you know, lives of, of billions and also reduce the cost um, um, to the, you know, health system. Epigenetics can help explain why we behave as a result of stressors or even trauma. But people can have very different responses to the same experience. What explains those differences? One example comes from Liberia, which was engaged in a 14-year civil war that ended in 2003. About a quarter of a million people died. I want to ask you a question. Uh, because it's just of interest to me. I just interviewed a man from Liberia who was there during the Civil War. Obviously, an enormous amount of stress. Right. His mother just gave birth to twins. They've got to get out. They've got to get to the refugee camp. They're, they're leaving. Um, his sister dies during this whole process. Again, more stress. And he thinks to himself, you know, I want to grow up and get into public policy so that I can help so right. kids don't ever go through this sort of thing. And yet his brother, who's similar in age, decides I'm going to get revenge and becomes a child soldier. So what is it about the DNA mapping that two kids from the same mother going through the same stresses, one decides I want to go down this path, the other goes in another direction? Yes. The, the responses are both responses, kind of adaptation to the adversity they suffered. And what we see in response to adversity is those two kind of responses, right? One is hyperaggression, which is like what we see in the low rats, right? Uh, in, the low monk in the monkeys without the mother, uh, they are much more aggressive than monkeys that were reared in a, in a, in a good and pleasant and, and welcoming world. But we also probably see the other response, which is trying to fix it. It's the resilience that develops. These guys are not only not hyper-stressed, they're the opposite. They're hyper-resilient. They learn how to deal with it. I think built in into what I explained before, which is this programming, is some freedom or degrees of freedom. So it's not fully anticipated. And it has to do probably with the biochemistry. The processes are not perfect. So it's not one-to-one -one relationship between adversity and the response of the genome. And perhaps a society survived as societies through evolution that they maintain a balance of these two kinds of people. The hypervigilant people who tell you, be careful, these guys are out to get you again. The rats need to know there are snakes and cats around, and so they need some rat that is hypersensitive that senses the, uh, this danger. On the other hand, you would not survive as a society if your entire society is, is focused on adversity. So it might well be that built in into the system, there's kind of uncertainty. And that uncertainty creates a heterogeneous response. That is, not all individuals respond the same way. And if you build a society, you need a mixture of those vigilantes, as well as the, you know, the calm, uh, socially fit people to enable a society to function under both adversity and periods of lack of adversity. As exciting as your field is today, you envision it being even more so in the future because of all of the Of course, and they will laugh at us. I mean, we're so primitive. Uh, we're making, you know, grand hypotheses uh, based on very little 
data, but we can see that that is coming. The question is where it w it's going to happen. You know, I'm trying to do some of it, others are doing. Um, but once it happens, it will be exponential, right? A the tsunami. whole system will say yes. And I tell my medical students, you know, we still teach you like in the Middle Ages, you know, <laughs> a professor stands in the room and teaches the wisdom to the student, then takes the student to the clinic and shows him the patient and, you know, kind of orally transmits the tradition from generation of doctors to another generation of doctors. But could you imagine the way a doctor will work, you know, when he has to deal with social media and artificial intelligence and, and communicating with people in completely different ways than the traditional way of going to a clinic. People might not never see clinics anymore. You know, the clinics will be virtual and the tests will be done uh, in, in a very different way. Fascinating. Thanks so much. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you.